bit of trivia, a bit of curiosity. What does that say? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, please. God is nowhere. God is now here. Is that what you said? And what do you see? God is nowhere. So those are two totally different ideas, aren't they? God is now here, and God is nowhere. Scripture, because of the fact that Scripture is written on papyrus, and papyrus was very labor-intensive, they didn't put spaces between words. All of scripture originally was written in capital letters without any spaces. So go figure. You have to look at this and figure out what the heck this is saying. It could be God is nowhere or God is now here. And God is now here is actually a sentence in the book of Deuteronomy. But you could easily mistake that for God is nowhere. So why am I pointing that out to you? I'm pointing that out to you because of the fact that Scripture is something that we have to be very careful when we read. It's something that we have to be careful that we've done due diligence, we've done our homework to understand what it means. Because we are in danger, if we just read it in a, in a haphazard fashion, of getting the message totally wrong. Now, we know that Jesus is fully divine and fully human, right? That's what our creed tells us. Jesus is the Word made flesh. So the Word of God has those same characteristics. The Word of God is both fully divine and fully human. Scripture is divine because it is inspired, which means breathed into. The Holy Spirit, the breath of God, breathes into the scripture. And so it is something which is really a privileged piece of writing to reveal God to us. It is God breathed. And if you look on your outline there, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is inspired or breathed into by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training. In righteousness. How many of you grew up in the South? Any of you who grew up in the South? Okay, so you know what sweet tea is, right? You know sweet tea is intensely sweet. Sweet tea is not just tea with a couple of teaspoons of sugar <coughs> stirred in. Sweet tea is intensely sweet. And if you leave a cup of sweet tea standing, after a while, the sugar in the sweet tea will precipitate, will fall to the bottom and crystallize. You might say that the whole church is inspired by God. All of us as a community or a graced community, we have the Holy Spirit. But there is, at the bottom of the glass, something intensely sweet, something intensely graced, and that is Scripture. St. Thomas Aquinas came up with a tongue twister. He said, Scripture is the norming norm which is normed by none other. <laughs> In other words, we can add on to what we find in Scripture. You don't find Lent in the Bible. You don't find Advent in the Bible. We can add on to what we find in the Bible as Catholics, but we can never contradict what we find in the Bible because it is the norm, which is normed by none other. So if we ever find ourselves tempted to believe something which contradicts Scripture, we know we're, we're wrong. The Bible functions as the shoulders of the road to keep us within certain parameters. So it is divine in that sense. It is a divine safety belt to keep us on the right track. But the Bible is also human, fully human. And that means that the rules that apply to interpreting human literature apply to interpreting the Bible as well. We know that the Bible was written, no matter what book of the Bible you're talking about, no matter what letter you're talking about, 
The Bible was written in a three-step process. First, there were, for example, in the Gospels, the historical events, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And then an entire generation passes before anything is written down. And during that generation, people told and retold the stories of Jesus. And things that they found helpful or inspiring or corrective, they gradually accentuated. And things that weren't so important, they gradually de-emphasized. So the stories were polished. The oral passing on was polished to accentuate what was most important. And then finally, somebody that we call a redactor picked and chose from those various stories and assembled a gospel written down a generation later. And we believe that all of that process was inspired. Some of the evangelical churches think that the Holy Spirit whispered in somebody's ear and he took down dictation. We don't believe that. We believe that it was much more of a process of collaboration between humanity and divinity. That instead of just somebody being led by the nose to dictate, to write down a dictation, there was this process of telling and retelling and finally writing down, and that God is involved in all of that, guiding it, but that human processes were still in place. Now what about inerrancy? There is an idea that the Bible does not err. We make a distinction that the evangelicals don't. They say the Bible doesn't err anywhere, we say the Bible makes no errors with regard to what its purpose is. Its purpose is to reveal God to us and to lead us to salvation. Its purpose is not to be a science book. So, for example, Jesus says the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. That's not true. The smallest of all seeds is an orchid seed. So, is the Bible, a book of botany, is that important? Is that important to Jesus? Is that important to our salvation? Of course not. So those things we don't see as being without error. We don't see the Bible as a science book. But we do see the Bible as a book revealing God and a book about salvation. And in those things, there are no errors. There are no mistakes. Since the Bible is a piece of human literature, as I said, that means that we have to apply all the ideas, all the, the practices that we use whenever we interpret human literature. That means we have to get back into the context of when it was written. How would the original hearers understand that? How would they understand that piece of writing, that piece of literature? And we have to interpret it the way they interpret it. We have, we have something what we call the literal sense. The primary sense of scripture is the literal sense, which means the sense that the original hearers heard. It doesn't mean to take it literally. The literal sense means to understand it the way the original reader, the original hearer, would have understood it. So on number three here on your outline, I've got a couple of quotes. Pope Pius XII's Divine Afflanto Spiritu, written in 1943. He's writing this to Bible scholars. And he says to them, Go back holy in spirit to those remote centuries of the East with the aid of history, archaeology, ethnology, and other sciences, and accurately determine what modes of writing the authors of that ancient time would be likely to use, and in fact did use. Now what is he trying to get at here? How many of you read the newspaper today? Okay, a lot of you. When you read the newspaper, you weren't even thinking about it, but you read different sections of the newspaper with a different attitude. We hope, it isn't always the case, but we hope that when we open up to the front page, that's a simple re reporting of the facts and only the facts. It's supposed to be an unbiased report, right? 
That's what we expect of the front page. Which isn't always the case, but that's what we want. But you turn to the editorial page, and you don't think that they're just giving you documentation. They're not reporting on the editorial page. They're trying to persuade. They're trying to lead you to view things the way they view them, right? And that's a totally different thing. So you're going to be more critical and say, do I agree or not with the line of argumentation here? It's a totally different form of reading, a totally different form of, of interpretation of what's being said. Then you look at the, the, the cartoon pages, the funny pages. They're there to entertain. They sometimes have, though, a little bit of a, a moral to them. You know that there's humor. You know that there may be some subtext of some wisdom underneath the humor. And so you read it with a grain of salt. You go to the advertisements. And you know that that's not an unbiased documentation of the facts. You know that they're trying to sell you a bill of goods. You go to the sports page. You know, imagine that you are somebody living let's say 500 years from now. And between now and those 500 years that have passed, there's been kind of a dark ages. And we've lost a lot of knowledge about what was going on in the 21st century. But lo and behold, somebody digs up a well-preserved document called a newspaper. And they find on it something that at the top says sports. They don't really know what that is. But right under sports, there's another big headline. Indians scalp cowboys. <laughs> and it says 2015. And you write your doctoral dissertation disproving the fact that the Indian and cowboy wars ended in the 19th century because lo and behold you have proof that they were going on in the 21st century. You see how you can misinterpret scripture. You have to understand the kind of writing that it is. A newspaper has a lot of different kind of writings. The word Bible means the books. And those books are written in two different languages over the course of 1,600 years. Which means that there's a lot of different kind of writings, a lot of different styles. The original hearers would have heard it or read it like you read the newspaper, automatically knowing how to interpret it. We don't know that because we are not in that culture. And so we have to find out what kind of writing is this so that we know how to interpret it. So what I'm trying to say is I want to encourage you to read the Bible because it is divine literature. I'm all for reading the lives of the saints and all sorts of spiritual reading, but there's nothing better to read than the Bible. It really is God revealing God's self to you. Nothing better. But you've got to be careful to read it intelligently, or else you could be lit, misled, and instead of reading God is now here, you might read God is nowhere. So you've got to be careful. So let me give you some examples. I mentioned that there can be comic books in the newspaper. Believe it or not, there are comic books in the Bible. There are really funny stories that are designed to make you let down your guard. You laugh, you chuckle, and then the singer, then the writer comes in and punches you in the ribs with something that you, because you let down your guard, you didn't protect yourself from. Because the writer knew that it was a message you might not want to hear. So he, in a sense, lulls you with some funny stuff first. One of the examples of that is the book of Tobit in the Bible. So here is the book of Tobit, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. <coughs> Tobit says, That night I took a bath. Then I went into the courtyard and lay down by the courtyard wall. Since it was hot, I left my face uncovered. I did not know that there were sparrows in the wall above my head. Their hot droppings fell into my eyes. This caused white spots to form, which I went to have treated by the doctors. The more ointments they tried with me, the more the spots blinded me, and in the end I became completely blind. This is read every other summer, and lectors get up and they read it very piously. But think about it. Tobit falls asleep outside in the garden with his eyes open. Who does that? 
and some birds go flying over in the middle of the night now and poop in his eyes. And then there is the eternal joke that always remains every generation, doctor jokes. The more I went to the doctor, the blinder I became. So this is about humor. This is vaudeville. This is lowbrow comedy. A little bit later, the next chapter, we get another depiction that's kind of funny in Tobit. It chanced on the same day that Sarah, the daughter of Raguel, who lived in Medea and at Batana, also heard insults from one of her father's maids. For she had been given in marriage seven times. And Asmodeus, the worst of demons, had killed her bridegrooms one after another before ever they had slept with her as a man does with his wife. The servant girl said, You see, you kill your bridegrooms yourself. That makes seven already to whom you have already been given, and you have not once been in luck yet. Just because your bridegrooms have died, this is no reason for punishing us. Go and join them, and may we be spared the sight of any child of yours. That day she grieved, she sobbed, and she went up to her father's room intending to hang herself. But then she thought, suppose they were to blame my father. They would say you had only one daughter whom you loved, and now she has hanged herself for grief. I cannot cause my father a sorrow which would bring down his old age to the dwelling of the dead. I should do better not to hang myself, but to beg the Lord that I may die and not live any more insults. I should have put the rest of it. I didn't put it, unfortunately. I guess I lost it. The rest of it is, she falls in love with number eight. And number eight really loves her. But number eight knows that seven have died before. So they get into bed, and they're not into bed one minute yet, where suddenly the husband jumps out of the bed and kneels down beside the bed and says, Honey, let's pray before we go to bed. And he goes through this long, elaborate prayer saying, I know that seven have died. I'm taking this woman honorably. Please preserve me from death. It's, it's, a, it's really a funny scene. It's kind of ridiculous. Now, what is the whole point of Tobin? At the end, everything works out. Not the way people expected it, but everything in the end works out that people are at peace. Tobin is written at a time when people are being persecuted. And life is so ridiculous that if you don't laugh, you're going to cry. And the writer is saying, Let's laugh, because in the end, we trust that God will make somehow this work out, that God has not abandoned us, that God is overseeing all of this ridiculous stuff, and that in the end, we're going to be okay. That's the point. Now, if you read this as if it's on the front page, you're going to get lost in, how did Tobit fall asleep with his eyes open. How did that happen? And how did the birds fly in the middle of the night and you're going to get totally lost? So you have to find out what is the kind of literature and what is the purpose. Another example, Adam and Eve. Adam is a Hebrew word, Chadam, which means the man. It's not a first name. It's not a proper name. It's a generic term, meaning the man. Adam is every man. Adam is not a historical figure. The book of Genesis is not a history book. It's a book about being human. What it feels like to be human. What we experience as humans. So think about forbidden fruit. Isn't it true that anything that's forbidden is more attractive? My mother told me years ago that there was a list of banned books back in the 40s and 50s. And she was a, when she was a schoolgirl in the 40s, there was kind of a bad girl in the high school who always made a point of going out and finding out what books were forbidden by the church. And she'd go out and read them. Because they had to be juicy if the church was, was forbidding you from reading them. So things that are forbidden are more interesting. Things that are forbidden are more enticing. So that whole story of the forbidden fruit is a story about the real truth that even when God gives us laws for our own good, we rebel. 
laws that will help preserve our society are still laws that we will chafe under because we don't want to have to obey a law. We want to choose for ourselves. Think about Cain and Abel. Sibling rivalry. We all know what that's like if we have a brother or a sister. And the story of Cain and Abel tell us that if we don't control that rivalry, it will escalate. It can even escalate to the point of violence. Think of the story of how Eve was made. I grew up in the Bible Belt. Believe it or not, Florida had a Bible Belt years ago. <laughs> I grew up at Avon Park, about two hours north of here. Smack dead center of the state, equally distant from both coasts. Ranches, orange groves. And we all believe that boys had one less rib than girls because Adam took, God took Adam's rib out to make Eve. We all believe that. What does that story mean? That God put Adam to sleep and took out a rib and created Eve. It's really a prophetic, revolutionary idea that wasn't always remembered by the Jews. She is made out of the same stuff that Adam is made out of. If she's made out of the same stuff, that means she's the same. She's equal. So this is the very first feminist literature in <laughs> Judeo-Christianity. The woman is equal to the man. But it also says what the woman's role is in marriage. She's made out of a rib. What does your rib do? It protects your heart and your lungs, right? Your lungs breathe. Your lungs are your spirit. Your heart is your soul. Your ability to give and receive love. So the woman's role in a marriage is to protect her man. She's equal to him. But just as he protects her physically because he's got the muscle, she protects him. She protects his spirit, his heart. That's what the book of Genesis is talking about. But if we get caught up in thinking that the book of Genesis is, is a book of biology, we're going to get it all wrong. We're going to miss the whole message. So the book of Genesis is really about what it means to be human. Why we feel the way we do. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got the book of Revelation. Revelation was written at a time when Christians were being persecuted. Persecuted so severely that if you were caught with a piece of Christian writing in your hands by the police, you could be sentenced to death. So how do you manage to convey a message in a way that's safe? You write it in code. The book of Revelation is written in very colorful language. Animals with seven heads and ten horns, a sea of glass, a jade sky, colorful, fantastical, cartoon-like. It's a comic book. But it's written with references to the book of Daniel. It's called apocalyptic literature. It's written in code. So, if you were a person who was a Jew, or you were well-versed in Jewish literature, you would know the codes. And you would be able to read that and get the message. But the police, if they caught the person giving this to you, would look at it and say, well, this is juvenile fluff. You're, you know, you're developmentally delayed that you're reading this crap. Go, be on your way. So it was a way of conveying a message that was going to be safe for the messenger. For example, how many of you have ever heard of, in the book of Revelation, the idea that uh, the Antichrist will, will brand on everybody's head 666? You've heard of that? Okay. 666 is the numerical. In, in Hebrew, there, a, a number can stand for a letter. 666 stands for Nero. The book is written about the persecution under the Emperor Nero. 
it's got very clear historical groundings in it, but it's in code. If you don't know the code, you're going to get totally lost. So it's important to learn the code. So I got one other quote here from Dei Verbum, which is from Vatican II, under number three. Seeing that in sacred scripture, God speaks through human beings in human fashion. It follows that the interpreters of sacred scripture, if they are to ascertain what God has wished to communicate to us, should carefully search out the meaning which the sacred writers really had in mind. That meaning which God had thought well to manifest through the medium of their words. Biblical researchers must look for that meaning which the sacred writers in given situations and granted the circumstances of their time and culture intended to express and did in fact express through the medium of contemporary literary form. Rightly to understand what the sacred authors wanted to affirm in their work, due attention must be paid to the customary and characteristic patterns of perception, speech, and narrative which prevailed in their time and to the conventions which people then observed in their dealings with one another. So you got to go back to how the original hearers understood it. Sometimes we're a bit chauvinistic in the sense that we assume that the Bible was written for us and only us, and that the way we understand it must be the way it has to be understood. But in fact, the Bible was written to particular communities in a particular time, in a particular culture, in a particular language, and you've got to understand all those particularities in order to get the story right. For example, Jesus calls Peter Rock, right? Peter is Simon, and Jesus gives Peter a nickname, Rock. <coughs> Peter, Petrus, a Latin word, we get petroleum oil from a rock rather than from an olive. Petrified, to become as hard as a rock. But what you might not know is there is a clear allusion here to a famous quote from the king of Sparta. Sparta had no city walls. And Sparta was in a war with Carthage and sent an ambassador to say, okay, we won't kill you if you right now surrender. And the king said, I'm not going to surrender. And the ambassador rather condescendingly said, well, you better surrender because, honey, you don't have any walls. And he said, come out tomorrow and I'll show you my walls. And the next day he took the ambassador out. And he showed the ambassador 10,000 men. Now, this is at a time when the population of the world is very low. So an army of 10,000 men is huge. They're all very, very well armed. And the king looked to the ambassador and said, Behold the walls of Sparta, 10,000 strong, and every man a rock. And that phrase of being a rock became part of the language of the day. And Peter, who is anything but rocky because he's wishy-washy, is told that he's going to become a rock. So when you understand the background, the language becomes so much more rich and you get so much more out of the meaning and the nuances that you find there in the Bible. Let's talk a little bit about dates. The Bible is composed of 66 books, at least in our Bible, 39 Old Testament books, and 27 New Testament books, written, as I said earlier, over 1,600 years by 40 authors. Our Bible is a little bit different from the Protestant Bible. And there is a reason for that. The Jews believed that for something to be inspired by God, and they were the ones that came up with the idea of inspiration. They were called by their neighbors in the ancient days the people of the scrolls, because they had these scrolls that they believed were words that were inspired by God. And they believed that for something to be inspired, for something to belong to their scriptures, it had to be written in Hebrew, and it had to be written in the Holy Land. But as a result of various wars, Jews were dispersed throughout the Mediterranean. And there was a huge community of Jews in Alexandria, Egypt. Egypt isn't the Holy Land, and they spoke Greek. 
but they wrote literature which they thought was inspired by God. And the Greek-speaking Jews throughout the Mediterranean agreed with them. The Jews in Jerusalem said, no, it's not written in Hebrew, and it's not written in the Holy Land. Therefore, it cannot be scripture. Because we came from largely those Greek-speaking Jews, they were the first Christians, we accepted the idea that those writings were scripture. So, Tobit, Baruch, Wisdom, Lamentations, additions to some other books, we accepted those as scripture. Centuries later, a thousand years later, when Martin Luther was having the Reformation, he said, no, you know, the Jews ought to know what belongs to Jewish scripture, so let's throw these books out and only accept what Jews accept as inspired in the Old Testament. So we do have more books in the Old Testament than a Protestant Bible has. Ironically, Tobit, the one that I mentioned that was so funny, recently, only about 30 years ago, we found that there is, in fact, a Hebrew version of Tobit. That it was, in fact, translated later on into Greek. We don't know where it was written. It may have still been written in Egypt rather than Israel, but in fact, there is a, a, Greek, a, a Hebrew version of it. So even Jews are beginning to say, well, Maybe this is something we ought to relook at. So we have more books in our Bible than Protestant churches. In our Old Testament, there are 46 books. In Protestant Bibles, there are only 39 Old Testament books. So the first of these were written in four, around 1445 BC, Genesis and Exodus. The very first New Testament books were written in the 50s. If you recall, I said that there was a, a generation where people talked before they wrote things down, and that that whole period of talking was inspired. So Paul is the first. First Thessalonians is the very first thing written down that's new, that, that, that we see in the New Testament. That's written in the 50s. Paul's writings go from the early 50s to the early 60s. Peter's letters are in the 60s. Peter is a fairly old man when he writes his letters. Jude is in the 60s or the 70s. And the letter of, letters of John are in the 80s. Remember, John is the baby of the apostles. He's the only one that isn't martyred. He lives the longest. In terms of Gospels, the very first Gospel is the Gospel of Mark. And that's written in the 50s. And what's really interesting about the Gospel of Mark is, even though we call it the Gospel of Mark, you might just as well say it's the Gospel of Peter. Peter is in prison. He's already been sentenced to death. And Mark is there to kind of support him. And Peter says, I want to get my memories down on paper before I die. And he knows that he could die any day now. And so he is in a rush. So Mark's Gospel doesn't give you any rhetorical flourishes, any elaborate descriptions, it's very short and to the point. It's action-oriented. Jesus did this, and then he did this, and then he did this, and, and then, that's, that phrase, and then, comes over and over and over again in long, run-on sentences. Because Peter is so anxious to get all this out that he did this, and then he did this. So it's really, really abrupt. It's not good Greek. It's not polished Greek. It's just get the ideas out before I die. Ten years later, Matthew and Luke will both write their Gospels. And we see that there are some times where they borrow from Mark. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when you put them side by side, all follow the same general pattern. They're called the Synoptic Gospels because they can be laid side by side and we can compare. There's the same order. Not only do we think that Matthew and Luke borrowed from Mark, but we think all three borrowed from an earlier piece of writing or oral tradition that we don't have anymore. We think it may have been an oral tradition that was so well memorized that it could be recited word for word, but maybe never got written down. It's called the Q source, and it is simply a collection of sayings of Jesus. If you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when Jesus is telling a parable, 
at the wording that he's using. He uses the same wording in all three Gospels. Now, they're written in three different places by three different people for three different communities. You would think there would be a lot of variation, but there isn't. They use very similar verbiage. So we think that there's some underlying source that they used. That may have been an oral tradition where people memorized and handed down the very words that Jesus used. And finally, well, not finally, but the last gospel is the Gospel of John. John is an interesting gospel in the sense that he knows he's been exposed to all the other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he wants to do something different. He is the Bible's version of Paul Harvey. He wants to tell the rest of the story. So, for example, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you find on Holy Thursday, the Last Supper, Jesus says, take this all of you and eat it. This is my body. This is my blood. That is not in John's gospel. He doesn't make any reference to the consecration of the bread and wine. He does something totally different. He gives us the account of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Because for him, that story illustrates what the Eucharist is all about. It is an empowerment to serve. To be strong enough not to think only about myself, but to be able to bend low and serve another. So John's Gospel tells stories that are different from the other three Gospels. He wants to tell the rest of the story. And because John is writing to a very well-educated, Greek-speaking community, his language is totally different from the others. Mark is the worst Greek. Mark's Greek is broken Greek. Matthew and Luke are somewhere in the middle. John's gospel is high literature. I mean, think about the way John's gospel begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came to be through him, and there is nothing which came into being which was not through him. It's kind of abstract, isn't it? It's high-flying theology. So John's gospel is written for educated, Greek-speaking people to convince them that even though they have been indulging in Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, that Jesus is a wise man, so wise, in fact, that he is divine. He is divine wisdom incarnate. And then finally, like I said, you've got Revelation, which is written close to 100 during the time when Christians are finally numerous enough where they are persecuted because they're noticed. Now, a lot of times you will hear churches say, we are a Bible-based church. And that seems to give the impression that the Bible fell out of the sky and a church was built on what the Bible said. It's not correct to think of a Bible-based church. It's more correct to think of a church-based Bible. Because it was that community that told those stories, that polished them, that wrote them down, and then decided which stories should go in the Bible and which stories shouldn't. It was the church that gave birth to the Bible, not the Bible that gave birth to the church. There's something called canonicity. This is something that Origen came up with. Origen is a third century theologian. Canon comes from the Hebrew words it says here on your, on your outline. Cane, a word which means reed. Reeds were measured and cut into standard lengths, and they were used as measuring sticks. So the canon of the Bible is the measuring stick by which we measure whether or not a belief is in accord with our faith. As I said at the very beginning of this hour, the norming norm, which is normed by none, other, by none other, it is the measuring stick by which we measure whether something is compatible with Orthodox, Catholic, Christian faith. Now, how did we come up with this list of books? Ironically, it didn't occur to us in the beginning 
to have to come up with a list of books that was definitive. Bishops would compare notes and they would say to each other during their meetings, what do you read at Mass? I find that my people really love this particular letter from Paul, this particular gospel. It inspires them, it motivates them, so we use this. What do you use? And they began to compare notes. And of course, in comparing notes, there began to be more and more similarity between bishops, so that there was more and more homogeneity in what was being read at Mass. And it was in the Mass that we determined what was inspired, what changed people, and what didn't. We know that very early on, there was already a collection of the writings of St. Paul by the year 100. The Didache refers to, the Didache is, in, in English it means the teaching. Already in 100, it refers to St. Paul's writings and quotes St. Paul. So we know that there was a collection of writings from St. Paul as early as the year 100. But there was not a complete list. Then somebody named Marcion came along. Marcion is a case of a silver la lining around a dark cloud. Marcion was a shipbuilder, wealthy shipbuilder, influential, the son of an Orthodox priest in the Eastern Church. But Marcion was rabidly anti-Semitic. And he refused to believe that the Jews could be worshipping a true God, that they must be worshipping a demon. And therefore, he thought, as Christians, we should not read any of the Hebrew scriptures. Furthermore, because Hebrew scriptures talk so much about physicality of resurrection, we should not read anything that says that Jesus physically rose from the grave and left an empty tomb. So he edited out not only all of the Old Testament, but a lot of the New Testament, and left us with basically Paul, with some excerpts taken out, and the Gospel of John. And the church said, nothing going, Buster. This is not right. The apostles said that Jesus rose physically. He showed himself physically to the apostles. He left an empty tomb. You may want to write all that out. You may want to use white out to get rid of it. But we believe that that is, in fact, what the apostles said and what they believed. And we are not going to part from that. So that caused the bishops to say, we better get a list of books that we think are authoritative teaching. We know that within 20 years of Marcion, 20 of the 27 books of the New Testament were already agreed on. But those last seven were a real stickler because there was some question. Were they in agreement with St. James' letter in agreement with St. Paul? You know, even Martin Luther said James' letter is an epistle of straw. He wanted it out of the Bible. And there was some talk about, can we reconcile James with Paul? And the church said, yes, we can. James talks about how you have to have good works. And Paul says you're saved by faith. But Paul says your faith, if it's true, will issue forth in good works, which is the same thing that James is saying. They're just different emphases. They're not different messages. And so James was accepted in the Bible. But it took a long, long time. So as a result of that, you've got, where's the date here? I lost it. Oh, 367. In 367, which is fully 170 years after Marcion, we finally get a list that is exactly the same as our list of books today in the Bible. And that has been ratified by the Lateran Councils, by the Council of Trent. Over and over again, the church has said, this is the list of books that are inspired. So you see, it isn't a case where the church is founded on the Bible. The Bible is founded on the wisdom of the church, with the, which the Holy Spirit infuses it with. What else do I want to say? I want to say to you that reading the Bible, because it is the word of the Holy Spirit, is something that can be transformative, something that can be positively dangerous, if you will, because it can change you, 
if you're willing to let it change you. Because they are not just human words. They are divine words. And they carry an authority and an inspiration that is beyond just nature. They impart grace. They impart a supernatural power which we can't drum up on ourselves by ourselves. So I really want to encourage you to read the Bible. If you haven't read the Bible in the past, start reading it. There was an unfortunate occurrence that happened in the, in the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther said, you can't add anything to the Bible. Everything that we believe has to be found in the Bible. So for example, like I said, Advent, Lent, even the Trinity can't be found fully formed in the Bible. Martin Luther said, sola scriptura, only the Bible, only scripture. We said, no, we can add on to that. The Bible is the sugar at the bottom of the glass of iced tea, but the whole glass of iced tea is sweet. The whole glass is inspired. So we can add on to that. We just can never contradict it. But because of this impasse between the Protestants and the Catholics, we became very polarized. We reacted to each other. Martin Luther, in the beginning of his career, admitted that there were seven sacraments. By the end of his life, he said there were only two, in rejection of the Catholic sacrament. We, on the other hand, in the beginning admitted it's essential that we read scripture. By the end, we were not doing that anymore because we thought, look at what had happened to Martin Luther when he read the Bible. He went and became a reformist. So let's not have people read the Bible. So if there was a while there where we didn't read the Bible. But Vatican II really reasserts the importance of reading the Bible. And you know more of the Bible than you realize. We have a three-year cycle on Sundays. In year one, we read the Gospel of Matthew. In year two, we read the Gospel of Mark. In year three, we, meet, we read the Gospel of Luke. And every year during Easter, we read the Gospel of John. So even if you've never bought a Bible, owned a Bible, read a Bible at home, you have heard all four Gospels over and over again in that three-year cycle. You've also heard an Old Testament reading and a New Testament reading every week, except during Easter where you've read two, Testament, two New Testament readings. So you've been exposed to a lot of the Bible. But I want to encourage you to expose yourself to even more. This is a wonderful publication. The Word Among Us comes out every month, and it picks a section of the Bible, and it gives you the background and the nuances so that you know how to read it intelligently that you read God is now here instead of God is nowhere. You get it right. Or you pick up a Bible commentary. If you want something really scholarly, you can go to the Jerome Biblical Commentary, which is you know, the highest of the high commentaries, scholarly, on what the Bible is saying. But there are a lot of helps out there. Don't read it as if it's the front page. Read it the way the original readers would have read it. And these things help you understand intelligently what kind of form of literature it is, how the original hearers would have heard it. But again, if you do that, I really think that you're going to find that it inspires you and that it changes you. I'm all for reading other kinds of inspiring literature, but this is the most important. Other literature is, is human. This is human, but it's also divine. This is God's gift to us. So take advantage of it. Think about the generation after generation that honed this and polished this and made this perfect for us. <coughs> Let's not cheat ourselves by not availing ourselves of something that can really be life-changing. That's my talk, but I'm open to any questions you might have. Right. Wow. More than I forgot to tell you. There were actually standards by which the church decided what should belong in the Bible. It wasn't just a matter of, you know, oh, I like this. There were some standards, and they're in your outline there. The first one was, anything in the Bible had to be written by a prophet of God. And they discerned that a prophet of God was somebody that did two things. Somebody that inspired and motivated, but also somebody that challenged. False prophets were people who just told you things that made you feel good, but didn't really challenge you. You know, there's that, I, I, I hate it, I have to admit, but the Precious Moments Bible, 
with all the cutesy illustrations, it's really saccharine. No prophet was saccharine. Prophets were direct. They affirmed you, but they also corrected you. So everything that's in the Bible, in the New Testament, when, when we were trying to decide what, was, what should go into Christian scripture, had to be a piece of literature that both inspired and motivated, but also corrected. Secondly, was the authority of the prophet confirmed by action? Was there a miracle? Every single writer of a New Testament piece of literature has miracles associated with them. And that's the pattern that we find in the gospel. Jesus teaches a message, and then he performs a miracle to show his authority, to show that his message has power. And that is the same with all of the writers in the New Testament. They give messages, and then they show their credentials by performing a miracle. Thirdly, does it tell the truth about God? You can't add something to the Bible that is going to contradict what older pieces of the Bible have already said about God. Remember, it's the norming norm, which is normed by none other. So you can't add something to the Bible which is going to contradict other writings. That's why in St. James, it took so long to figure out whether or not James' letter would fit with Paul, because Paul had already been accepted as Christian scripture. So it can't contradict. And finally, it has to be accepted by the people. It was, in the end, the people in the pews <coughs> saying, Amen, that resulted in the things that are in the Bible being there. They heard it. It touched their heart. They felt power in those words. And they said, this is a divine message. And as a result of that, that's how it got in the Bible. So again, it's a church-based Bible, not a Bible-based church. One other thing I wanted to tell you about is Lexio Divina. Now, the primary sense of scripture is, like I said, the sense of the original hearer. But we can also use scripture in prayer in a way that doesn't teach us <laughs> doctrine infallibly, but might give us a private little message. It's a way of allowing the words of scripture to incite our imagination and to allow God to speak to us. So it's not the original, it's not about, about finding out what was the original meaning of this writing. And it's not about finding out the authoritative meaning of this passage. What it is is, I read a passage, and I let my mind wander. What does this mean to me? What touches me about this reading? What inspires me? What turns me off? What makes me question? You ask, you know, what, what just sticks out? And you try to figure out, okay, is God speaking to me through this? And then you go to God in prayer and say, this is what I'm hearing, God. Am I right? Is this what you're telling me? And then you go back a second time and pray some more, again looking at the reading, thinking about it, looking for clarification. Is the same message coming to you, or is something now different coming to you? As if to say, no, you got it wrong the first time. So you come back and look at it again. What am I hearing this time? And then finally, you settle the idea of, okay, this is what I'm getting out of this scripture. This is not the original meaning. This is not the universal meaning. This is what God wants me to hear today. And lastly, and most importantly, when you realize what God is saying to you, you act on it. The last point of Lexio Divina is that you make a decision to do something, to change something, to act in a way that you've maybe been passive in the past, or to stop acting in a way that you've acted before, but to make a physical change in your behavior. And by doing this, you're not getting the original meaning of the Bible, but you're allowing God to work in a different way, to use the Bible to speak to you in a conversational way to help you grow in holiness. It's called Lexio Divina, Divine Reading, and it has been used since the third century by monks. Every month, every day, practices Lectio Divina. It's a wonderful way to use scripture in prayer, to use it in a way that you can, in a sense, personalize the Bible for your own use. Father, wasn't uh, the Gospel of John, didn't it, uh, the Catholic Mass originally end with the Gospel of John? 
question was, didn't the Catholic in Mass the originally the end word, with the Gospel the of John? With, it didn't uh, originally end with the Gospel of John, but in the 17th century, there was the prologue of the Gospel of John was added to prayers at the foot of the altar. If you, if you remember, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but before Vatican II, the priest said, the Mass has ended, go in peace, you think it'd be over, but instead he goes down to the foot of the altar, and there are more prayers. There are prayers for the conversion of Russia, there's consecration to Mary Immaculate, and there is the, God, the prologue to the Gospel of John. That was an add-on. And Vatican II tried to go back to the original Mass. The original Mass didn't have that add-on, and so it was taken away. Mark? The uh, book that Max The Book of Maccabees is written in Egypt, and it's written in Greek. And anything that is in, in Jewish scripture is written in the Holy Land in Hebrew. And so as a result of that, the Jewish rabbis did not accept it as divinely revealed. They saw it as a very, very uh, praiseworthy piece of literature that could inspire, but they didn't see the scripture. The early Christians who were Jews living in Alexandria they considered it inspired, and so it ended up in our Catholic Bible. Martin Luther took it out because he thought we should stick with the Jewish list. Father, how would you uh, reconcile or put in context the church's magisterium with the Bible? The church's magisterium is, in a sense, limited by the Bible. The magisterium can add, can add on to what the Bible says. You don't find the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception or the doctrine of the Assumption in the Bible. But the church can never, the magisterium can never contradict what is found in the Bible. So the, 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 the scripture, in a sense, keeps you from going off the shoulder of the road. It sets the parameters for those things which the magisterium can say. And in fact, the Magisterium bends over backwards to try to find at least some scriptural foundation for anything it says. Even if it's kind of putting a circle into a square, it does try to find some biblical illusion that will defend any teaching that is not strictly, obviously, out of the Bible. Yes, um, the Gospel of John, is it allegorical or is it literal? I've heard from a Protestant a lot of stories that we do not take literally. The Gospel of John is, is more stylized than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, no, I, I wouldn't say that. It, 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 it's neither of the extremes that you've mentioned. In, in that culture and in that time, uh, a true biography was not concerned with exact data like Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. A true biography was to show the why. Why was Jesus who he was? Why did he say the things that he did? Why did he do the things that he did? So John is okay with fudging a little bit on details to highlight the whys. So there are times when John's gospel does not exactly correspond to the synoptics, but that's not because he's trying to lie to you. He's trying to highlight for you the things that he really thinks you need to know. And so there are times when maybe it isn't exactly historical data, but it's a case of an interpretation of the historical data highlighting what he thinks is most important. And in his generation, in his culture, that's kosher. That's perfectly fine to do. That's considered being a good historian. Oh, lots of questions. Uh, how do you ask, uh, answer an evangelical and they say the you know, that's, that's a typical example. The world is only 6,000 years old. That's a typical example of looking at the Bible as if it's a science book. It's an example of us superimposing our issues over a generation that lived thousands of years ago. That wasn't their issue. They weren't asking, how old is the world? They were asking, why is it that I have such difficulty following the law of God, the forbidden fruit? Why is it that I have so much difficulty getting along with my family, Cain and Abel? Why is it so difficult for me to get along with my wife, Adam and Eve? Adam says, the woman made me do it. Eve says, the serpent made me do it. Everybody's got somebody else to blame. You know, it's, it's not about history so much as about 
fixes that we find ourselves in in each and every generation. It's about the human condition. I don't know how to convince somebody else of that because they're just stuck in the mindset that it's the front page of the newspaper, that it's a science book, and, and they're not really willing to listen to the idea that it's something else. Think of the tortoise and the hare, Aesop's fable. The book of Genesis, much of it, is kind of like Aesop's fables. The tortoise and the hare is not a piece of history, but isn't the tortoise and the hare a parable that tells the truth? That you don't have to be the hare, you don't have to be the fast one. You can be slow, but if you're persistent and disciplined, you can get there. That's what that parable tells us. Genesis is a group of parables that tell us truths, but they're not historical truths. They're more metaphorical truths about the human condition. That's the best I can do. Father, uh, would, it, would it not help uh, to, if, uh, if the epistles were from the Old Testament, were somehow or other uh, there'd be a setting or a background or an, a sort of a because sometimes you read a something from the Old Testament and it makes absolutely no sense yeah. because it's taken so out of context that we don't understand what it is. It seems to me like there should be more explanation to get you to understand why they're reading that particular. Yeah. That, that, that's the, the priest's job here in the homily, to try to explain to you. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we don't always do a great job of that. But that's, you know, you, you've got readings there and, the, and the, the expectation is that the priest will fill in the gaps for you. Doesn't always have that. Father, you mentioned uh, the Jerome Biblical Commentary, which you said is excuse me, pretty heavy duty. Yeah. Is there is there another commentary less heavy duty that would be <laughs> but more comprehensive than than the word of Um yes. The Collegeville Bible commentary. Thank you. A couple more questions back here. Picking up on your analogy about the newspaper, you can't pick up the newspaper today without seeing Islam. And <clears throat> it's scared me to do a reading of Islam. I found out there was a Quran and there was a Quran 700 years after Christ. But they do have the Quran, and they feel that the Quran is their Bible, but they also say that they recognize the Jews of the Old Testament, and they make quotes like uh, uh, Mohammed talked to the angel Gabriel. Conversation, and that's in the Quran. Yeah. Yeah, do you have any idea about uh, about that at all? Is there is there any connection there at all? Well, both Christianity and Islam gets the idea of scripture, sacred writ from Judaism. Yeah. And just as we recognize Hebrew scriptures as divinely inspired, Islam recognizes both Hebrew scriptures and our scriptures as divinely inspired. They interpret them radically differently, just like sometimes we interpret Hebrew scriptures differently from Orthodox Jews. But they recognize that there is something divine there. They think that Jesus was the greatest of all the prophets. They venerate Mary. They, they do believe that Jesus was uh, born of a virgin. So they, they don't believe he's divine. They don't believe he's divine. They believe just he's a great prophet. Father, can you talk about the concept of original sin in the context of Adam as every man versus Adam as the first historical man? Yeah, sometimes we have to kind of differentiate between our concept of original sin and the story of Adam and Eve, because that concept of original sin doesn't come around until Augustine, and we tend to conflate the two ideas. Scripture is basically just the idea, the book of Genesis is just the idea that Adam is easily led astray by something that is forbidden. And it is an explanation for how, when God gives us laws that are perfectly reasonable and that we can see really are for our benefit, you know, you know killing one another, stealing from one another, committing adultery, that, those things don't provide for a good society. The Ten Commandments were given to the Jews when they were about to stop wandering in the desert and settle down. And they needed some guidelines now that they were going to be in close proximity to each other, because before this they could spread out. Now that they're going to be living shoulder to shoulder, how are you going to get along with each other? So God gives these rules and says, hey, this is a favor I'm doing for you all. I'm giving you these rules so that you're not going to kill each other. And yet, as soon as God lays down the rules, 
they become even more difficult to follow because people feel hemmed in by them and they have a rebellious spirit. So the book of Genesis is actually written right around the time that they settle down. And it's written as a way of explaining to them how something could be so good and yet so difficult at the same time. So it's really about how all of us have forbidden fruits in our lives. You know, you go on a diet, I've been on a low-carb diet for the last six months. Carbs have never been so attractive as they are right now. <laughs> I salivate at the thought of bread, I tell you. So, so that's what the, the book of Genesis is saying. Augustine developed a whole theological concept that is not necessarily um, founded, well-founded on the book of Genesis. Augustine came up with the idea that reason dictates to will, and will dictates to action. So for example, I think to myself reasonably, I need to eat from the five basic food groups, I need not to overeat, I need my fiber, I need Brussels sprouts. <laughs> so that reason creates the will that I'm going to eat Brussels sprouts. I hate Brussels sprouts. So <laughs> creates the will that I'm going to eat those. And then the will follows the action. I actually do what I've decided I'm going to do. Augustine said, and this shows Augustine's hang-ups as much as anything else, that when we were conceived, our moms and dads were not being dominated by reason. They were being dominated by lust. And as a result of that, it turns everything upside down. So now instead of reason leading the way, will leads the way. Will leads reason by the nose. So I think to myself, you know, there are some amino acids in dark chocolate which can be found <laughs> in no other fruit. I better get busy and start eating dark chocolate. And the next thing I know, I'm eating dark chocolate like crazy. And reason is somehow subjugated to that will. Augustine says that it is will that creates sin, a willfulness. And he sees a giving over of ourselves, a surrendering, or a surrendering of our reason to will in eating the forbidden fruit. But like I said, they're not exactly the same thing. We very often conflate the story of Adam, Adam and Eve and say, well, that's a story about original sin. That's Augustine's idea. Okay, one last question. Has there ever, uh, in, in like the last probably 50 years, of the, the items that didn't make it into the Bible, have they gone back to reevaluate whether they wanted to add them? Well, that's kind of like the forbidden fruit, isn't it? You know, you, <laughs> you look at things like the Da Vinci Code and, and the Gnostic Gospels. Gnostic Gospels deny the physicality of Christ. They think that he was Casper the Friendly Ghost. He never really was born. He never really died, he never really suffered, he never really rose, he was a phantom. People read the Gnostic Gospels with such relish these days, they're very, very popular. Uh, the Gospel of, or the proto event, the Proto-Evangelium of James, never accepted in the church because it really makes Jesus look like a spoiled brat. Um, somebody makes fun of him and he strikes them dead. You know, there, there are things that are not in accord with what we find in the Bible. Most of the things that we find in these documents that are ancient, that were not admitted to the Bible, like I said, very early on, 20 of the 27 books were clearly picked out as being, as being canonical. The things that were completely dismissed were dismissed for obvious and clear reasons. And so even though we read them to this day, we look at them and we say, oh, of course, no, I, I see exactly why this was never in the Bible. This is not, it's, it's not something that an apostle wrote. It's not something that corresponds with what the apostles wrote. It's a totally different Jesus, uh, very often contradicting the very fundamentals of our faith. Should we stop? Thank you.